All right, welcome. It looks like we are live. Welcome everyone. I think we have a full house. Last time I checked, we had just a few hundred people, close to a thousand actually scheduled to be at this um, event. So, so excited to have everyone here. Tonight we have some amazing people to share their stories and their wisdom with us. My name is Meryl Fury. I am president and CEO of Plant-Based Nutrition Movement and what an honor it is to be able to introduce our three guests tonight for Own Your Health. This is all about us taking control of our health being responsible and able and capable all about it. So you'll get plenty of information about that this evening. Let's start with introducing our guests. We'll start with Chef AJ and I have to read because these people are just way too impressive for me to be remembering what's going on with them. Chef AJ has been devoted to a plant exclusive diet for over 44 years. She's host of the television series, Healthy Living with Chef AJ, which airs on Foodie TV. A chef, culinary instructor, and professional speaker, she is author of the popular book, Unprocessed, How to Achieve Vibrant Health and Your Ideal Weight, which chronicles her journey from an obese junk food vegan faced with a diagnosis of precancerous polyps to learning how to create foods that nourish and heal the body. Look at her. Look at her. Is she not gorgeous? I love her. The latest best-selling books, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, A Revolutionary Approach to Conquer Cravings, Overcome Food Addiction, and Lose Weight Without Going Hungry, and Own Your Health, have received glowing endorsement by many luminaries in the plant-based movement. Chef AJ broadcasts Chef AJ Live on YouTube and Facebook daily. She's the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which has helped hundreds of people achieve that achieve the health and the body they deserve. We are so grateful to have you here with us today, lady. Welcome. Thank you, Meryl. Uh -huh. Next up is Dr. Michael Clapper. He's a graduate of the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. He's practiced acute care medicine in Hawaii, Canada, mm -hmm. California, Florida, and New Zealand and for the past 35 years has been focusing upon health promoting food and lifestyle choices to help reverse disease and prevent the need for hospitalizations and surgery. A longtime radio host and a pilot, Dr. Clapper has served as nutrition advisor to NASA's programs for space colonists on, moon, on the moon and Mars. At his website, drclapper.com, visitors can find practical insights into nutrition and healthy living through his numerous articles and videos, as well as subscribe to his free newsletter, Medicine Capsule. Along with an active telemedicine practice, Dr. Clapper's passion and professional focus is in his Moving Medicine Forward initiative to incorporate the teaching of applied nutrition into medical school education worldwide. Thank you, sir, for everything you're doing around that. Welcome. Thank you, great to be with you. Last and certainly not least is Glenn Mercer, a playwright, screenwriter, and author. He's authored or co-authored 11 books with a vegan message. His latest book, Food is Climate, a response to Al Gore, Bill Gates, Paul Hawken, and the conventional narrative on climate change, argues that the only way to reverse climate change is to put an end to animal agriculture. Glenn began his career in book writing as a co-author with Howard Lyman of Mad Cowboy. Glenn is also co-author of The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss and Unprocessed by Chef AJ, as well as other books advocating plant-based eating in 20, plant-based eating, sorry. In 2020, Glenn wrote Own Your Health, which is where we got the title for this particular program this evening. Um, and Chef AJ contributed over 75 recipes to that book. Prior to focusing on book writing, Glenn was uh, had a clear as sorry Glenn had a career as a playwright and spent some time as a stand-up comic. You will notice his um, rather sharp wit when we're speaking tonight. He worked mainly in San Francisco. Glenn grew up in Belmore, New York, and attended New College of Florida in Sarasota. You'll notice that um, we have a ticker running at the bottom. 
we will be including their contact information in the ticker and we'll also have that in the show notes. I will tell you now a little bit about plant-based nutrition movement. We are the ones who are hosting these three wonderful guests this evening. Plant-based nutrition movement was started in 2018 by Dr. Stephen Loam, a cardiologist. Our mission is to connect person to person within communities, particularly vulnerable communities, to fight the epidemic of acute and chronic disease. With the advent of the pandemic, PBNM also offers programs online to support the health of humans, beyond humans, and the planet by actively promoting the benefits of whole food, plant-based ways of eating. So with that, we can jump in. Today, we are talking about what it takes to really own your health. We have a medical doctor. We've got a person who is a beyond specialist in food prep and um, making recipes and delivering delicious stuff to the table. And Glenn, who is an amazing author and very well studied in health and climate. So also, I want people to know the chats are open. They're being manned or womaned in this case, <laughs> and um, put in your questions and we'll do our best to get to them. Get to them. If you put like a um, maybe a two or three question marks at the beginning of what you write, we'll be able to see them quickly and easily. And if you want to target or aim the question to a particular one of our guests, put that in there too, so we know. All right. All right, we're getting comments. This is wonderful. Yes, top-notch speakers we have. That's right. Okay, I wanna start with this one really general question. If everybody could just give me a really quick answer. Tell me, how important do you think nutrition is in the prevention of some of the thorniest illnesses we have? Aha. <laughs> All right, let's start with AJ. <laughs> Obviously nutrition, oh, with AJ. It is. Nutrition is as important to uh, prevention of disease as oxygen is to breathing. Beautiful. Dr. Clapper? Yes. Uh, when you're, you're driving the car down the highway, um, how, uh, how important is your hands on the wheel and, and which way the wheel is, is the point is there? Well, it's a matter of life and death if you're going across the yellow line or not. And, uh, and, this river of nutrients that's coming into our uh, body with every meal. It's up to us to uh, decide if that river is pure or if it's all full of pollutants. And if it's full of pollutants, then the system's going to get toxic. And that's where these diseases are coming from. A pure, quote, a, a pure river of, uh, of healthy whole plant foods, uh, fresh water, sunshine, exercise, um, that, uh, that makes this body hum you know, like a finely tuned engine. So uh, yes, it makes all the difference in the world. And, and a whole food plant-based diet is square one. All the other things are very important, but square one is honoring our herbivorous nature and uh, eating a whole food plant-based diet. Great, excellent. Glenn? I'll, I'll answer it with a statistic. We have about 650,000 people who die every year of heart disease. But if people ate the way Dr. Clapper and AJ and I eat, I don't know if it'd be a thousand, ten thousand. It certainly wouldn't be in the hundreds of thousands. It would be very, very few people dying of heart disease. And COVID, we've had about eight hundred fifty thousand deaths. I don't know if there've been any of people who eat the way we eat. So mm. that's how important it is. It is overwhelmingly important. It's it's almost the whole ball game. Well said. Yeah, excellent. So let's go into that a little bit. Maybe, um, Dr. Clapper, this might be one for you. Can you tell us about a little bit about the studies or the, the data that shows um, the connection between diet and the outcomes for COVID? Because I know people are really just in a tailspin, scared to death of this illness. Yes, um, as far as the COVID one, went by a couple of weeks ago, I saw it uh, British Medical Journal, I think, uh, showing that uh, if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, your chances of getting so sick with COVID that you have to be admitted to the hospital shrink uh, to one out of 50, one out of 100, uh, much, much smaller. And that's not surprising. We can spend all evening talking about the physiology of why a whole food plant-based diet would equip you 
well to uh, to get through a COVID episode if you had one. I was sick with COVID a couple of weeks ago, and I was achy for a day or two. My nose ran for a couple of days, and it was gone. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do uh, with my diet, the fact that I'm not obese, and that I eat all these phytonutrients. And, uh, you know, we're swimming in viruses all the time. Uh, they don't have to cause a disastrous infection. So, uh, again, it depends what you eat and your lifestyle, getting enough sleep and all that's important. Uh, but uh, the studies that are coming out, you know, there's no money in, in telling people to eat a healthy diet, unlike the latest antiviral drug. And so they haven't been pushing it. And then, you know, the, the third rail, the elephant in the room that people want to talk about is obesity. And, uh, and uh, if you are obese, you are far more likely to uh, wind up in desperate straits from this virus. And the beauty of a plant-based diet is it's mostly fiber and water. People get leaner on it. And so all the way around from sprucing up your immune system to, uh, to overcoming obesity, I'm not surprised the plant eaters uh, come out way ahead in this study. And it's just another validation. They're, they have much less heart disease, much less cancer, much less colitis, much less everything. You know, the lights are flashing, eat a whole food plant-based diet, and COVID is, is emphasizing that. Great, great. AJ, let me ask you a little bit about obesity. I know that you have, that's one of your main topics in your writing. Tell us a little bit about what you see as a connection with obesity and health, and even from your own experience would be great. Well, you know, I've been hosting something called the Truth About Weight Loss Summit now in its fourth year. And it's not just me thinking this, it's some of the best doctors that you can imagine that I've interviewed and probably over 150 now. And this notion of health at every size is a very nice notion, but I don't know how true that is. And as we're seeing with COVID, with the people that did have excess body fat, they just didn't seem to fare as well. And so it's not about shaming people or blaming them for being overweight or obese because it's not their fault. If you want to blame somebody, I would say blame the processed food industry. But that said, you know, we should love people at every size, but to say that they can be healthy at every size is proving to not be true. And it's amazing what happens when people lose the excess body fat. And the thing is, is not everybody has to get down to a size two to see results. The great thing is, is any amount of weight people lose will put them in such a better state of health that it's, 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 it's incredible. And it's, it's also very inspiring to see the kind of changes people make when they lose the body fat, because so many of the diseases that they get, the chronic lifestyle diseases are associated with it, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that this this idea that, you know, I, I think we're starting to accept the fact that people have gotten much heavier as as normal now. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. The people that are not overweight or obese are in the minority now. And it's funny because now we're being thin shamed, you know, like and but but the thing is, is it's not about being just thin. It's about being healthy. And, yeah, there's probably some people that can have a little extra girth and be, be fairly healthy. But for the most part it's just linked to so many of these chronic diseases like insulin resistance and type two diabetes, so many different forms of cancer, heart disease. And that's my concern is because, you know, I came from a family of people that were obese and morbidly obese, and we never made the connection that that's why my great grandmother lost both of her legs to diabetes or, you know, or that my grandmother died of congestive heart failure, or my mom died of a bowel obstruction. It, nobody ever said it's because they were obese, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something. We don't make those connections at all. It's not um, a normal leap in the typical conversation, right? Yeah, I ate that this morning. It shouldn't be still affecting me three days later, <laughs> but it does. Right. Well, Dr. Clapper always says your body's never not looking. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you don't hide from yourself. <laughs> exactly. You can't tell your body, look over there and eat a cheeseburger down here. What, what was that? You know, I didn't do anything. Yeah. Who are you kidding? Yeah. And, right. uh, we got to stop kidding ourselves. In fact, I read a report, I think last week, that um, the coronavirus has a real propensity to fat tissue. Uh, it turns out that, that if you've got lots of extra body poundage, you're putting out the welcome mat for the coronavirus. And uh, another reason why you don't want to have a whole, whole lot of body fat uh, hanging around. So uh, uh, again, the red lights are flashing. You know, 
Yeah. Uh, to our cancer, cancer also seems to love adipose cells. Sure does. So, you know, fat shaming isn't what any of us are interested in doing. It's just that there's really no such thing as a healthy, obese person. Hmm. You know, it, it, the, the only way to achieve ultimate health is to be on an optimal diet, which will get you down to your proper weight. And and um, it won't be an obese weight. Right, right. Thank you, Glenn. That, that's <laughs> so. I have some family that are uh, in the southern states, and this is a conversation that we have. You know, very challenging when you have a um, a whole the bottom half of the country seems to lean toward high fat, lots of gravy, butter, sugar more sugar, desserts a lot. Um, yeah, it's a challenge. And particular, particularly difficult um, for African-Americans. We're some of the heaviest people in this country anyway. Not like we, it's not a genetic thing either, you know, but it certainly happens. So thanks for bringing all that up. We're getting a couple questions in the chat. I do want to let people know <clears throat> That yes, we have Dr. Clapper here, but he cannot answer your specific medical concerns. So um, keep the, the questions as general as possible and we'll bring them forward. Uh, somebody wanted to know your thoughts on tofu, Dr. Clapper. Uh, I, I give tofu a thumbs up. Um, there's um, a lot of misinformation. We're in the age of misinformation. I think a lot of it was put up by the animal food industry in the 90s when they saw their sales going down uh, and people were eating more soy products. So they put out a tsunami of anti-soy propaganda that it's full of estrogens and it'll uh, it's like putting your baby on birth control if you give them soy formula and it gives you man boobs and makes your son gay and all these uh all this nonsense when the truth is actually the opposite. Uh, and, you know, back behind it all is, oh, it gives you breast cancer. The estrogen, too much estrogen gives you breast cancer. Well, the truth is, when you look around, uh, the countries that consume the most soy products, Japan and Korea, have the lowest uh, rates of breast cancer. If a woman has a breast cancer and she's eating soy products, it grows more slowly uh, than if she's eating uh, animal products. Uh, and uh, there's just no contraindication uh, to consuming soy products. No one's saying eat two pounds of tofu every day, but if a few times a week you want to cube it up and put it in your in your in your spaghetti sauce or your stir fry, that's uh, absolutely appropriate. So, uh, uh, so I'm a big fan. And if you look on Dr. Greger's site and just go to Google Scholar and just put in soy and breast cancer, you'll find it's actually protective and there's no real severe downside to eating soy products and I saw a question go by about a woman in perimenopause. Yeah. I recommend uh, soy products for to take advantage of those uh, phytoestrogens in tofu and tempeh and, uh, and edamame. If a woman's in perimenopause, she should, uh, on a pretty daily basis, once a day, at least every other day, have a good dollop of soy in her, in her diet, I think would help her with her uh, menopausal symptoms. Excellent, excellent. We do want to sort of caution people, soy is one of those highly processed GMO type products, right? Um, well, let's uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the vast majority, 90% of all the soybeans grown in America and around the world are not bound for tempeh and tofu. This is animal fodder, this is animal feed. And you bet they have genetically modified that uh, those soybeans destined for animal feed uh, in ways that uh, I don't want to contemplate. That is not human food. The tofu you buy at the health food store, where especially if it says organic on it, cannot have GMO soy in it, right. and uh, and it, it isn't. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'll just leave it there. But but if you uh, would, uh, with the standard uh, nowadays, there's lots of companies making it. Even the big companies have gotten in. Uh, do they use GMO soy? I don't even think you can make good tofu from it. So as long as you're buying uh, good organic tempeh and tofu, uh, it isn't GMO. So, so don't worry about that. Don't be uh, put off by that. All right. We have another question here. Um, let's see if we can get, I want to see what Glenn's answer for this one's going to be. All right. This one is, 
in the case that you get a cold or a flu, or you think you're starting to get sniffles or whatever, what would you say would be the best foods to eat? If you're talking about owning your own health and staying out of a doctor's office, if, right. you're, if it's not necessary. What would I you think do? the alliums, onion, garlic, um, and, and the foods with vitamin C, so lemon. So, you know, if I feel something coming on, my wife will often prepare something with the ginger and lemon and, and dinner will involve garlic and onion. And uh, that seems to do the trick. Nice. How about you, AJ? You know, I think when you're sick, I think you got to really listen to your body. And, you know, there's the whole thing, uh, starve a cold, feed a cold, that whole thing. Sometimes the best thing is to not eat. I know that sounds crazy, but and Dr. Clapper is going like this because he worked for years at True North Health. You know, people are always looking to add something to the diet and add something, you know, add this nutrient and this this supplement. But sometimes it's best to take things away. And, and just let the body rest. And of course, you know, have water, maybe have some vegetable broth, you know, maybe some vegetable juice. But, but I think sometimes just not eating is the best way to get over a, a sickness very quickly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Be beautifully answered, AJ. I, I absolutely agree. Both these answers are just excellent. Listen to your body. If you're hungry, eat, but mm -hmm. keep it light. And, and as Glenn said, the Allium family uh, probably have some uh, uh, phytonutrients that will help your immune system. But AJ is absolutely right. And you have to take a tip from the animals. You know, when the animals are sick, uh, they, they don't eat. They stop eating. They curl up under a tree for a day or two, just drink water, and they, and they let it pass. And we should probably do, you know, take advantage of that. If you're hungry, by all means eat. But if you're not hungry, listen to your body and just drink water. That, and especially if you're running a fever, you want to drink that water because you are losing water uh, in your sweat and in your breath. And if you get dehydrated, then the secretions in your lungs, your mucus gets thicker. Yes. And thick mucus sticks there and bacteria can grow and it can turn into official bacterial infection. So drink that fluid and move those lungs. Sit up every half hour, take three, four deep breaths. Um, if the weather's nice, go walk around the block. Uh, and sleep, uh, get enough sleep. Uh, your body really can marshal its immune forces while we're sleeping. But um, but if you're not hungry, just drink water till you get hungry and keep it light during those days of illness. Yeah, excellent. I will also add, I know there are probably some people on this call um, who are not completely whole food plant-based or maybe they're, you know, just tapping their toe in the water. They're They're trying to figure out one thing for sure. Now, this is me as a nurse talking. Stay away from dairy products. Please do not. <laughs> Milk and cheese and yogurt and ice cream um, is very, very difficult when you're trying to fight off uh, an upper respiratory infection. Thickens the mucus, makes it hard to move. All right. We have another question in the chat. Um, how about this one for AJ? How do plant-based recipes stack up against vegetarian eating? Well, I think I mean, I think that everything that is plant-based is vegetarian, isn't it? And everything that's vegetarian is plant-based. You know, I'm going to be honest. You said before we started to be honest. Yes, and, do. I, and, and as much as I love Colin Campbell, I hate the word plant-based. Okay. I've never liked it because it doesn't mean anything to me. Because when you say you're plant-based, you could be eating 49% of your calories from sugar, from animal products, from meat. I like plant exclusive. Well, you know, I like vegan too, but vegan sometimes has some political connotations and, and, and so other people don't like the V word. But to me, plant-based means the bot that, or, or this plant forward or plant predominant. I mean, I'm like, I mean, come on, you know, the, the planet's dying. It's time to go all in people. We can't just keep dipping our toe in and expecting, you know, things to change, especially our health, especially if we're, over, if we're older. So, uh, you know, vegetarian is, is you know, Obviously, any that said, any step a person makes in the direction of doing better, I'm all for. And I know not everybody can do everything, especially all at once. But to me, vegetarian, there's different kinds of vegetarians. There's lacto ovo. You know, vegetarians often eat eggs, milk, or both. And if you love animals, you don't eat any parts of them. You don't eat any of their future children or their secretions. And the, the thing is, is many of us became vegan for ethical reasons first. And I think all three of us on this planet, or not, well, not on this planet, on this stream, 
on this this virtual planet have that ethical peace. And if you really knew what went on behind the scenes, you would never eat eggs, knowing that chickens are the most maligned of all the creatures and, and cows too. And so, you know, Dr. Clapper always says milk is to grow a, it's, it's baby growth, baby bovine growth food. It's to grow a baby calf to 800 pounds in a year. And it's, it's if you're doing it for ethical reasons, you're not really being very ethical if you're having milk and eggs, if that's your reason. If you're doing it for health reasons, that's just as deplorable. So I think people have to understand that while being vegetarian is nice because you're excluding other animals from murder, like, well, you know, whole cows, pigs, lambs, things like that, you're, you're still torturing and abusing a lot of them. And so it's funny because if I'm working with, it's, I don't want anyone to eat any meat, but if they have to eat meat, I want them to eat as little as possible as, as, you know, as they can. And so if I was working with somebody that's not vegan or vegetarian, I would, I would start getting rid of dairy first. That would be the first thing I would get rid of even before the meat. So, um, you know, I really, you know, I, I was asked this on, on, I was being interviewed for, by this doctor today and he said, well, you know, how would you tell somebody to make the change? And I would say, well, I would tell them to watch Forks Over Knives, Cowspiracy and Earthlings. And if those three movies did nothing for them, they're, they're probably never going to get it. So I think I think that should be required viewing for anybody that's considering this because it hits all the notes. It hits the ethical argument. It hits the planetary argument and it hits the health argument. And so I don't, I, argument's not the right word, but reason that, but yeah, uh, yeah, for, other, exactly. for other people, it's the argument, the people that yeah. don't believe that, that our planet is dying. And so I think that's really important because I think when you just do it for one reason, like for example, doing it for your health is wonderful. And I noticed a big upswing in people becoming vegan, plant-based, whatever you want to call it, after forks over knives. But these aren't people that always stayed eating vegan because if they did it for their health, then they could get away with having fish a couple times a month because they probably could really, you know, our ancestors ate some meat, but when you've got that ethical piece in place as your foundation, you're just never going to do it. You're never going to do it. And that's to me, I find that the longer a person is vegan, even if they went vegan for the environment or their health, that ethical piece starts to creep in. It's very hard to, um, to, to not let it creep in, but you know, even, even, even old, I don't want to say the names, but even su certain people in the movement that we know as old curmudgeons now are becoming more ethical in their hearts <laughs> after years and years of not eating animals. It just, it just sort of happens to you. So, um, you know, plant-based to me could mean anything. And that's why it's, it's either you're either vegan or you're not. Right. Right. And you started out saying um, all whole food, Plant. Uh, all vegan recipes are vegetarian, but not all vegetarian recipes are vegan, right? Something like that. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. That makes total sense. We have another question from the chat. We'll stick with you, Chef AJ, and maybe go to Glenn. Do you have any suggestions for alternatives to soy for people who can't eat soy? Yeah, me, I'm allergic. So yes. And I didn't even know this. Somebody had to tell me, but I actually saw it at a nutrition store called Clark's. They have pumpfu and hempfu. So what they do is they can make tofu out of hemp seeds and pumpkin seeds. So it looks like tofu, it tastes like tofu, it cooks like tofu. But for those with soy allergies, guess what? You got your own tofu now. It's amazing. Oh, that's excellent. I'm I'm not tolerant for soy. I can't take. I yeah. will look for those. You said to pumpfu. You get them online. So in pump p u m p from pumpkin okay. seed hemp. Got it. Pumfu and pumfu. And it's, it, 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 I didn't know either. And then when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. So for us soy intolerant, there is an option. I will be looking for those. Wonderful. Excellent. That's wow. great. That's yeah. great. Um, Glenn, do you have any suggestions along those lines? I just want to have some hemp food. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I'm up for some pump food, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? My mother used to make great pump food, and I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. Anybody who just came in, we're talking to Chef AJ, Dr. Michael Clapper, and Glenn Merzer. My name is Meryl Fury, and we are having a rollicking good time with some nerdy whole food plant-based conversations here. Beautiful. Um, let's is see. there sesame seafood? <laughs> I think I you should invent that. <laughs> Definitely you should invent that. Uh, let's see. 
Um, we had a question in the chat that came up. What is the relationship between cholesterol levels? Sorry, I'm dropping something here. Um, and fasting. Oh, my. Um, <clears throat> well, cholesterol levels, we're talking about uh, background of this particular fat in your blood over time. Uh, when you fast, um, frequently we saw at True North, uh, cholesterol levels go up. Uh, people are emptying out their fat cells to burn the fat for energy. But there's cholesterol in, that, in those fat cells. So that cholesterol comes out of the fat cells into circulation. And if you put a needle in the arm and, and uh, draw some venous blood, you'll see the cholesterol is at 240, 260. It freaks people out. But this is just a transient rise. It's not injuring your arteries. It's not adding to atherosclerosis. This is just the body shifting metabolic gears, getting into the fasting state. And it's, it's benign. And it really doesn't matter. As, as I said at the beginning, the cholesterol, you, you, know, you want to know what it's doing month after month, year after year. I mean, how long do you fast for? Uh, five days, two, two weeks, whatever. Uh, the cholesterol go up, goes down, doesn't do any harm during that time. Uh, so you're in such an anti-inflammatory state. Uh, on, a, on a water fast. And, and we now know that formation of the atherosclerotic plaques in the arteries is an inflammatory process. Uh, that's artery abuse that the owner of the arteries is inflicting on the artery wall there. And, but if you're not doing that during a fast, you're just drinking water, then let your, let your liver put out a little extra cholesterol, let your fat cells put out a little extra cholesterol. Uh, it's benign. It clears out of the blood after the fast. So not to worry about it. Great. That's, thank you. That, I think that nailed the person's question. That's excellent. I'm getting a little bit of a reminder from my backstage people um, that we have to acknowledge and thank Chef AJ and Dr. Clapper and Glenn for some very generous gifts they've offered. Um, we have three books from AJ. They're signed. Three books from Glenn Merzer, signed. Um, and some online classes from Dr. Clapper, for a donation of $40 or more, we will happily send that to the person who's donated. You'll just go to pbnm.org slash donate, click that button and fill out the, the form that shows up there for you. Thank you very much. Okay, on to the next question. What is, well, let's, let me start with this one. How crucial is it, do you think, to have a plant-based doctor or, or medical provider? In an ideal world, we would, they would all be plant-based. It wouldn't be an issue. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do in our Moving Medicine Forward uh, initiative is to graduate a whole generation of young, bright, nutritionally aware doctors who always ask, what are you eating? And who know the importance of the patient's diet and these diseases. That, that should be the norm. We're working to, uh, uh, to make that happen. And we'll hopefully talk about that a bit later. But until that happy day dawns, when, when all physicians are nutritionally aware and awake, um, uh, what to do? Um, you kind of got to make your own patchwork here. If you, uh, if you fall down and break your wrist or you gash your hand open, go to the nearest urgent care uh, center and get sewn up and get your fracture set. And it, and it doesn't matter if the doctor sewing your hand up is plant-based or not. You're just asking them to do a service for you. So for the acute care stuff, uh, it doesn't matter. So don't drive yourself crazy or them crazy trying to find a Are you plant-based while they're sewing up your hand? It really doesn't matter. Um, but the longer term issues about your blood pressure, your diabetes, um, especially, well, they're all going to be involved in what you're eating. And you do want a plant-based awareness uh, from your healthcare professional. So where do you find that? Uh, lots of places online. Uh, fortunately, uh, the then the uh, services have risen to meet the need. Uh, and I work for an organization called plantbasedtelehealth.com. And we have a whole stable full of plant-based doctors uh, with medical licenses in all 50 states. Uh, and 
And we will never wag our finger at you for being plant-based. We'll cheer you on and we'll help you get off your, your diabetes medication. We'll help you get off your high blood pressure pills because uh, that's the power and the beauty of plant-based medicine. So if you need to find a plant-based physician, they're around. And if you go to uh, uh, plantbaseddocs.com, you can often find one. But again, plantbasedtelehealth.com will be glad to help you. And uh, so seek and you shall find. So it's getting easier till again, more and more young docs grow out and graduate with that awareness. Of course, plant-based is the best way to eat uh, or plant predominant, plant exclusive. Uh, and, they, and they practice it themselves. You know, those are the ones that we want everybody to have access to. But till that time, um, uh, just go with the standard care till you need to find a plant-based doc and then look around. We're, we're available. All right. I, I would I would add that for any metabolic disorder, if you're not going to a to a plant based doctor, in a sense, you're really going to a doctor who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. You know, I mean, the, if, the, if, the, if the cause of your problem is nutrition and you're going to a doctor who only knows what pills to prescribe for that condition, how are you going to get better? You know, so. Telehealth is a beautiful thing because really your physical presence isn't so important. What's important is the dialogue with the doctor and understanding nutrition. And so I would recommend for anybody who's dealing with an issue like type 2 diabetes or obesity, set up a telehealth appointment with a plant-based physician rather than just going to a conventional doctor in your neighborhood. Well said. Yeah, yeah, perfect. A follow-up question to that. So if majority of doctors are not studied in plant-based, right? It's not what, what we medical people learn in school. Nurses don't learn it. Doctors don't learn it, right? So if your doctor isn't plant-based and is recommending treatments or medicines or something um, maybe a bit more aggressive than could be managed by plants and changing a diet, what do you do? Um, what's the best approach, you know, to avoid getting into the whole medical treadmill that people can get on? Do you just humor the person? Do you look for somebody new? What would you say to that? Uh, Ron. Go ahead. <laughs> Ron. Ron. Ron to plant-based telehealth and have a consultation with Dr. <laughs> Clapper. You know, until you've actually had an appointment with a doctor like Dr. Clapper or any of the lifestyle medicine doctors, whether virtually in person, you you don't you you will have no idea what a difference it is. You know, I didn't really get a lifestyle medicine doctor until recently, and I have never up until then. Have you ever had a doctor ask you what you eat, how much you sleep, right. what your stress is like? If the answer is no, then you got to find another doctor because, you know. Um, and if a doctor is asking Chef AJ, what do you eat? That doctor isn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> well said. You know, I, I think like Dr. Clapper said, that's fine, you know, for, for an acute emergency. If you're somebody like my husband, who's like, I don't know, we've been married like almost 30 years. He's He was sick once, you know, then I think it's fine if you go to whatever doctor you have to go to to get your insurance uh, updated or whatever. But if you've got a disease, you've got to go to a plant-based doctor because you will be told that, and it's not the doctor's fault because they didn't learn this, but like even things like, okay, so for example, my cholesterol is really low, which means my good cholesterol is also low. And they, they actually, in, in this chart system that we have here in the desert, it's called my chart, and a yes. lot of hospitals use it yes. so that you can communicate easier. So when they put diagnoses, like, you know, like, for instance, I have hypothyroidism, that vegan, like that to them is a disease. Mm -hmm. Vegan mm -hmm. is my diagnosis, you know, <laughs> because my HDL is going to be low because my total cholesterol is low. And Dr. Clapper has this wonderful DVD where he explains blood tests. And he explained how if you don't have any garbage, you don't need garbage trucks. And it's not their fault right. because all they see are people that are sick. And so when they see somebody of normal, like my blood pressure is like 88 over 55. And they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. I exercise a lot. I don't, but like they treat veganism and health as a disease. So I think you, you've got to get at least on your team, a plant-based doctor that you can consult with. Even if, you know, I understand you want to have a local doctor, but man, don't let them treat you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. <laughs> 
I just found a, a, a doctor here in Wisconsin who is one of those who's asking about sleep and uh, do you take supplements and what kind of diet are you on and how many servings of vegetables do you get a, get a day? It is a, a very different medical visit. Very, very different. But Great. Then, yeah. <laughs> Hold on to them. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, of course, uh, insurance can be a challenge with that, you know. But yeah, but if you don't pay the doc, if you don't pay that doctor, you're going to be. I mean, right. you, people don't until they do it and see the value of it, it. It is really not that expensive in the scheme of things. Right, right. When you look at, you know, we get often the question about is in whole food, plant based lifestyle way of eating expensive, right? That's one of the big ones, like not compared to a open heart surgery. It's not, you know, <laughs> or not compared to metformin and then insulin and everything else. No, it's. There, well, that opens up. There, there is such an important question and it's such a common misunderstanding of uh, the reality of it. Uh, when, uh, so let's just take a minute with that. Um, when it comes to the staple foods, where you get your calories to keep your body going, where you get your protein, um, rice and beans are cheap. You can get a 20 pound bag of rice for 10 bucks. You can get a 15 pound bag of lentils or dried beans for 12 bucks. And, and you'll eat them, they'll last you a month. Um, the, the main staples are cheap and uh, you soak them overnight and or cook them and eat them. Uh, that's, you know, that really should not be a, a, a deterrent. And if you, um, uh, if you're not putting out money for T-bone steaks and Gruyere cheese and premium ice cream, then you got a few bucks to uh, to buy the organic broccoli and the organic kale. And uh, and and there's all sorts of ways you can uh, 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 make fresh produce happen in your house. You can you know, join a, a community supported agriculture movement, a CSA, and they they deliver fresh produce to your house. There should be really no excuse uh, to to not eat plant based from the monetary point of view. As I said, the staples are cheap, and and and, and I I take joy in paying the extra couple of bucks for the organic produce because I want to support those farmers who are taking care of the soil and not using all those pesticides on the planet. So uh, so that that should be the least of the issues. Don't let that be a deterrent that you can't afford it. You can, and as Meryl said, the, what you really can't afford is one trip to the ER or one, even one trip to the doctor or one trip to the pharmacist these days, and you're gonna dump 300 bucks there. So um, so all the way around the, uh, the staple food, when I say rice and beans, that's shorthand for potatoes and all the wonderful grains and all the different legumes and the chickpeas and the hummus. And you know, there's so much wonderful, Low cost protein and, uh, and calorie rich uh, foods from the plant kingdom. Uh, really, there's a, it's, it's a bargain every way you look at it. Right. Yes. <laughs> Another way to save money is not to not to go down the medical mill and let doctors test you to death. You know, we we have an epidemic in this country of um, of nodules on the thyroid. How did that happen? Is that in the water? What's going on? Well, they, they take so many damn tests and take so many images that they're seeing nodules on thyroids that were always there. <laughs> but now they make people worry about it. And I, I, I would ask Dr. Clapper, what, what's the best way to, to kind of uh, avoid letting them take pictures all the time and knowing when to say yes to that and when to say, no, I don't, I don't want all those pictures. Great question. Well, wow. um, yeah, everybody's different. And in, in recognizing the predicament of the physician, you know, every once in a while, one of those lumps is going to be malignant and you don't want to miss it for the patient's point of view and welcome to American medicine. You, you don't want to get sued for missing right. a, a tumor there. And so right. you bet they're going to be, much better all the way around, order the imaging, order the imaging, and it's kind of CYA medicine there, protecting your backside. Uh, and, you know, and so that has a lot to do with it. The litigiousness of our society drives a lot of this imaging. And, uh, but, if a, but if you don't have a big, strong family history of, of cancer anywhere, uh, and you've had it imaged once or twice, and it's benign, uh, I would not keep getting scans on it uh, if, if you really establish it and your diet is really clean. Uh, you know, that's a real issue here. If, if you're eating 
uh, fried meats and, uh, and oily, sugary foods, uh, and there's a strong history of colon cancer in your family, then you're, you're playing with fire there, and uh, then you should need to get the colonoscopies, et cetera, et cetera. But if that's not what you're eating, and there isn't a strong family history in your, in your family, um, get it checked out once with a scan or a colonoscopy. If it's benign, um, I would just watch it. Uh, if, if any new lumps show up, get a, get a coligard or something like that. But I wouldn't have annual colonoscopies uh, for that reason. Okay, great. Thank you. That, that, that is a question. Um, like, how important is it to go back for those recommended, you say, like the mammograms? Right. right? Every several years. Yeah. Um, the way I feel about mammograms, the, um, it's a powerful technology, um, but I'm not in favor of shooting x-rays through the breasts of 150 million American women every year you know, looking for lumps and bumps, because you'll find them, like Glenn is saying, and then that launches her down the rabbit hole of biopsies and scans and mastectomies and all of that. Um, but if I have an individual woman sitting in front of me in my office with a lump there, uh, it's a reasonable send over for a mammogram, find out what's the nature of that lump and you know, decide what you want to do about it at that time. So it's not that mammography has no value. It has a value for an individual person. But again, you have to, when it comes to screening especially, uh, I uh, want to know who the woman is sitting in front of me. And do you have any uh, family history of breast cancer? Nope. Um, uh, when's the last time you ate dairy products? Oh, 30 years ago. Uh, and you know, what's your daily diet like? Rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies. The odds of this woman sprouting out a breast cancer um, are it could fit in a flea's navel. I think it's really tiny. So, um, so I would say get one mammogram just for peace of mind. And if that's clear, man, I would not get another one for you know, either if ever or for you know, give it three years, five years. Uh, it depends who the individual person is. Now, if she says, you know, my mother, two aunts, and my sister all died of breast cancer at age 40, well, now that's a different situation. And you've got you to tailor your advice to the individual person sitting there. But uh, if she's on the other side of that, just no family history, a completely plant-based diet, uh, again, the odds of her sprouting out of breast cancer are really tiny. So only minimal surveillance for those folks would be needed. Great. All right. Next question. So we're talking about, um, let me back up. So in nursing, we talk a lot about the patient being a part of the healthcare team, right? Those be patient in the center and the healthcare team is all around the patient providing information, support, the diagnostics, everything, right? Is that really the optimal sort of a relationship. Is that really what doctors are interested in having with a patient? Is that like a pipe dream? Or how does that, how does that, how do you see it play out in reality? Well, I want to be a partner with the patient. Uh, you know, the, the age of, of the paternalistic physician, you need this, my dear, and uh, I'm the doctor, I know best. You know, who? that's back in the 1950s. You know, uh, I, it, what does she want? What does he want to happen? What is his understanding of what's happening in their body? What do they want to happen? And what are they willing to do about it? Those are the, the key questions. And at this point, you bet we become on the same team. How can I help them achieve their, their goals? And, and it might be referring them to a surgeon. I'm a doctor, and that's what they want me to do. Uh, but it might be very often that they just need a counselor. They need a health coach. Uh, they need a, a, a counsel with a dietitian. And I welcome those professionals on the team. I don't have the time or the skills to do what they do. Uh, so... That's not a bad model with the patient in the center and you pull in these other support folks who has needed. But the doctor and the patient uh, do have this intimate nuclear uh, relationship that needs to be honored and nurtured. And uh, it's a precious thing, uh, especially if you've got a doctor who's really working for, I'm working for the patient. She's not working for me. It's the other way around. And as long as you have that relationship with your, with your physician, uh, then you welcome in these other professionals uh, as needed to the healing circle. Right. Right. You know, I would add to that too. If you don't have that relationship with your medical team, 
time to find a new medical school, Yes, right? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The, yeah. the, the, you're not working for the doctor and find another one. Uh, life's too short, literally, especially with, literally. in this situation. But you don't have to put out, I'm afraid of my doctor. I'm, if I can't ask for the, then find another doctor. You should be at ease with your physician. You should, you should be a person you can look right in the eye and say, do I have a cancer? Why did I get lightheaded last week? Um, do you think my diet's okay? You ought to be able to ask those questions. And if you're, if you're too intimidated, then you're in the wrong system. Find someplace where you feel at home. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Glenn, I'm going to ask you the next one. So when you're looking for a doctor or you're going for a doctor's appointment, how do you interact with the, the MD? I know you're... <laughs> I, I uh, say Glenn is a little bit more confrontational than a lot of people. <laughs> okay. Well, I go, I go in for an annual checkup, um, you know, mainly just to see how my doctor's feeling. And, uh, <laughs> you know, keep the relationship going because I want to feel that I have a doctor. Um, but um, uh, I don't have in, in the town I'm in now, I don't have a, plant-based physician, but um, I, uh, my wife has been doing telehealth with a plant-based physician. And so if I had a need to, I would certainly uh, go that route. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to have health care and to feel you have a relationship with a doctor. And at the same time, we have to realize as a society that that's not the source of health. Nutrition is the source of health. And I think back to when there were the big fights under President Obama when he was trying to get Obamacare. And they talked about it as health care, what it really was with health insurance reform. Uh, and I think it was, by and large, a good thing. Um, it made it more affordable for many people. Many more people got access to medical care because they had health insurance, which I think is a good thing. But it didn't make Americans healthier. Obesity, when President Obama took over, was 35 percent, and when he left, it was 39 percent. Yeah, just having access to health care isn't going to make you slimmer or healthier or, or uh, you know, more fit. That's something you have to do with your own diet. And um, and this this model of relying on doctors to make you healthy by giving you pills uh, doesn't work. Right. True. Uh, you know, and hence our conversation, right? We have to own our health. We have to be responsible for what goes on. As you can have the best doctor in the world. I've seen, I've worked with some amazing physicians, but if the patient is not interested in being responsible or taking um, the recommendations and they just want to go about their business, still smoking cigarettes and being a couch potato and eating McDonald's every day, it's uh, not going to change anything. In fact, it's probably just going to get worse, right? Right. Yeah. You can you can lead a horse to tofu, but can't make him eat it there. <laughs> right. And, and I, I make a point in On Your Health that I'd like to make here, which is that people think of nutrition as controversial. You know, they hear the uh, the paleo diet versus the vegan diet, and they think there's some sort of controversy. The controversy is contrived. All the science is on one side. It's, it's at, and it's the same thing with the climate. Is, is there a real controversy on whether the planet is warming? There isn't a controversy between scientists. And there isn't a controversy between scientists on nutrition, really. All, there, there, for example, Dr. Esselstyn did his study in which he took heart patients who were really <clears throat> on their last legs, as it were. You know, they, they had serious heart conditions and had already had many heart attacks. Um, and he put them in a study with the Cleveland Clinic, he put them on a low fat plant exclusive diet. Uh, and he didn't even make any conditions about exercise. It was just a low fat plant exclusive diet. And they, everyone who stayed compliant with that diet uh, did, did extremely well, had no further cardiac events. Now imagine if somebody had proposed to the Cleveland Clinic, I've got an idea. I, I want to take your sickest heart patients and put them on 
sausages and mac and cheese with some sugary soda pops and uh, and see how they do. Uh, do you think the Cleveland Clinic would approve that study? I mean, of course not. They don't want to get sued. So we all know, we all know what works. There's no real controversy. You can't reverse heart disease with a meat-based diet. We know that, scientific fact. It's like hot air rises. So there isn't any real controversy. It's not a battle between science and science. It's a battle between science and culture. It's between, you know, it's the TV commercials selling the pizza versus science. And, and so if anyone is under the mis misapprehension that there's real legitimate controversy out there on nutrition, not really. I mean, maybe over whether coffee is healthy, you know, or some minor things. But the basic truth that the only route to health is a low-fat, plant-exclusive diet, that's, that's beyond controversy. It's proven science. Right. Tell that to the paleocardiologist. Well, you know, they haven't been paying attention. <laughs> there are very few of them, you know, and there are a few scientists, there are a few scientists out there who deny global warming, you know, but they're very few. Um, and m most of the uh, scientists who, will, who would deny what I'm saying, most of the doctors who would deny what I'm saying now, either haven't studied the science or they're in the pockets of the meat industry or they're just taking the attitude that, well, nobody can change their diet anyway. We're a meat eating culture. Um, but the, the real science is overwhelmingly on one. You know, there, there, there are hundreds of studies that show that your blood pressure becomes healthfully reduced on a plant-based diet. There isn't one study that shows it, it's reduced on eating meat. And how could a diet that gives you healthy blood pressure not be the best diet for the human being? You know, we know that meat will raise your blood pressure. So how could meat possibly be healthy? How could raising your blood pressure possibly be a good thing? Beautifully said, Glenn. You, you ought to write a book. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, you know, on that note, since you brought it up, Glenn, let's pivot a little bit. I am of the opinion that the earth is one organism, right? And we're sort of like, for lack of a better way to put it, we're like bacteria on that organism, right? And all the other animals are, I don't know, they could be sort of like bacteria too, right? Um, I am of the opinion that the health of the planet is directly correlated to the health of the individuals that inhabit the planet. I know that um, the three of you are quite passionate about what's going on with the condition of our um, ecosystems and planetary health and how do we do what we do and how our food impacts the world. And so let's, let's do a little pivot. Who wants to start with my biggest question? There we go. What do you see as the most pressing issue related to the, the connection between how we function, how we are as humans, and the health of the planet. What is it that we need to know? Glenn wrote a book, Food is Climate. Um, so I will, I will defer to my colleague. Uh, it's, it's only 60 pages long. You can read it in an evening. Please get this book and read it. Glenn, tell us about the book. Well, the reality is, it's what you said, we're part of a, a complex organism, planet Earth. And when you live the way we were designed to live, that organism thrives. And so if we eat the foods that we're meant to eat, like all other animals do in the wild, if we eat the foods that we're meant to eat, then we wouldn't be chopping down the Amazon in order to put cattle in the Amazon. We wouldn't be creating deserts um, and the planet would thrive. Um, I tell the story in Food is Climate about uh, lobster fishermen. Now, most people who eat lobster don't think they might be killing a whale, but the truth is that the lobster fishermen put these traps on the bottom of the ocean and they have ropes 
up to buoys on the surface and and whales often get trapped in those ropes. Um, and whale feces um, is a source of nutrients for phytoplankton. And phyto, when you have a healthy phytoplankton population, then the phytoplankton emit a chemical called dimethyl sulfide that rises in the atmosphere, um, bonds with water droplets, and forms clouds. The clouds cool the earth. Now, nobody with a harp, harpoon ever thought about that. So, you know, when we mess with nature, when we eat foods that we're not supposed to eat, when we have these industrial fishing operations that are trawling the bottom of the ocean and digging up sediment from the bottom of the ocean, we're destroying the planet. We're destroying a complex web of life that evolved over millions of years. And it's extraordinary arrogance to do that. We should respect life. You know, I, I, I think that our interactions with wild animals, rather than taking bats out of a cave and eating them or feeding them to other animals in a wet market and causing a pandemic, you know, the only interaction we should have with wild animals should be, you know, National Geographic documentaries. Let's look at them and admire them from a distance and leave them alone. Leave the animals alone, leave the fish alone, leave the whales alone, and we should eat our food. You know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. And um, so, so that's my answer is that we should take our place in the, in the universe and we should realize that all the science is telling us that our place is as herbivores and we should stop destroying forests in order to create deserts so that we eat crazy food like cows. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think about, Glenn, are you familiar with Chief Seattle? No, no not really. He said a quote a long time ago, man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. And whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. also says further down in that same quotation that when all the animals just are gone, there's going to be a great loneliness on the planet. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. The wild animals are now just a few percent of what they used to be. The vast majority of animals on this planet are cows and chickens and pigs. And, you know, that's the biomass that we've uh, that we've traded these magnificent animals for and taking their lands. And as Glenn says, cutting down the trees is, is the primordial sin. Yeah, I, I can do nothing but shake my head and roll my eyes when I see these guys putting billions and billions of dollars into this carbon capture technique uh, machinery that will suck carbon dioxide out of the air. When Mother Nature has come up with by far the best, most efficient uh, carbon capture mechanism ever designed, they're called trees. And they take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into solid wood uh, and nourish the soil while they're doing it. And there's more CO2 goes in the soil. Uh, and that's really the key is to um, give back the land that we've taken for animal agriculture, let the forest come back. Uh, and we will need so much less land to feed ourselves on a plant-based diet that the earth will heal. And, and we'll see it. The waters will run pure. The, the, again, the soils will stabilize. The, the temperatures will start coming down uh, uh, the, uh, on every level. The, the earth will heal and will heal. We'll be healthier people uh, who don't need to go from operating table to ICU. Uh, and there'll be money left uh, if you're not paying it down the black hole of, of, uh, of health care. There'll be money to send kids to college and put internet in everybody's house and fix the roads and all of that on every level. And no matter how you look at it, the lights are flashing. People, you want to be healthy uh, individually, adopt a plant exclusive diet. Homo sapiens, you want to survive on this planet as a species, adopt a plant exclusive diet. You know, the, no matter how you look at it, the message is loud and clear, uh, but the folks making money, and I, I want to hear that. And nah, 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 I can't hear you. Uh, mm -hmm. What's my, my bottom line for the third quarter? But um, as Greta Thunberg said in Glasgow, you know, all we saw was two weeks of, of celebrating business as usual and blah, blah, blah. And right. uh, it's too late for that. As AJ said, the planet's dying. Uh, this is 
no no time to just put your toe in the pool. It's time to, to jump in. Uh, we need to become plant eaters for every reason you can think of. And so the food tastes great. It's cheap. Uh, it's life affirming, health producing, uh, and uh, and tofu lasagna is delicious. So uh, uh, go plant based. I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, that's going to take. You know, we put it on billboards uh, across the country. Uh, yeah, you, so when you re when you realize how serious this climate emergency is, and and how could anyone not realize it just when they see the wildfires in California? When you realize how serious this climate emergency is, and then you realize that Al Gore and Bill Gates and so many others talk only about fossil fuel burning as if that's the only cause of the climate crisis. Now, I, you know, I'm not gonna hold any water or any oil for the fossil fuel industry, but clearly this is not gonna be the way we solve the crisis by focusing only on fossil fuels. We've been trying to do that for 30 years and we're burning more fossil fuels now than we were 30 years ago. And even if next week, somehow miraculously, we're flying on solar airplanes and nobody is heating their homes with any fossil fuels or cooking with fossil fuels, and everybody's driving an electric car, and all the electricity is generated with solar panels. Even then, the planet will keep heating up. Why? Because we're chopping down forests for, to put cows on it. We're degrading the soil. We're using nitrogen fertilizer. The methane from the cows is, is 120 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. Um, so we'll be continuing to heat the planet with our animal agriculture, even if we got to a, a zero fossil fuel world. But now let's go with the opposite fantasy. What if tomorrow we all went vegan, which is within our power? The other thing isn't within our power inventing the solar airplanes. But if tomorrow we all went vegan and we and we freed up the grazing land and let the trees come back and the forests come back and we left the oceans alone, we stopped the industrial fishing and let the phytoplankton bloom and the sea forests bloom, we would draw down enough carbon dioxide to get us back to pre-industrial levels. So it's the only way to solve the problem. You, in a sense, you have to go on the offense. When, you, when you're talking about fossil fuels, you're just on defense. You're just saying, well, let's reduce how much we're hurting the planet. No, let's help the planet by planting trees and letting them plant themselves and draw down the carbon dioxide and protect the oceans so the oceans can be a healthier carbon sink. And we go on the offense in a sense. We, we, we draw down carbon dioxide. It's the only thing that could work. Yeah. I, back in October, um, the, uh, I think it was the British government published a paper online. And I have just the, the face sheet of it here. It was called Net Zero Principles for Successful Behavior Change Initiatives. It was only online for about three hours. And it had to do with what did they think and actually it was a research paper commissioned by the British government. What did this research organization think people should do if they really wanted to get to net zero by 2030 or maybe 2050, right? <clears throat> the paper was pulled down after about three hours because the British government said they didn't want to tell people what to do, right? But there were two things, I mean, that's crazy by itself, right? <laughs> but there were two things in the paper that they recommended. One was decrease your air travel. That was one. The other one was have every person decrease their, and they only spoke about ruminants, right? Sheep and maybe deer and cows, you know, the four legged, right? Mm -hmm. Decrease ruminant consumption by 35%. That's what they say would make a difference. Uh, if well, we could get yeah. everybody to decrease by like, at least 50. Let's go even further. A hundred. Yeah, you're, you're asking a total, you know, but people are stubborn and people cling to pork chops like I have never seen people cling to things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's if able to reduce to 50 percent. It would be Mer massive. Merrill, it's it's way too late for Meatless Monday. 
Yes, it is. Um, we need to ask people to eat like human beings, eat human food all the time, not Meatless Monday. You know, if 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 I if I was trying to solve a, a problem of 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 crime in the public, would, would, how would this be for a program? Don't shoot anybody on Tuesday. You know, you have to, it has to be a seven day a week program. And seven days a week means no more animal products in the diet. That's the way we defeat animal agriculture. We all need to accept that if it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy on Tuesday as well as Monday. It's unhealthy after 6 p.m. as well as before 6 p.m. Just cut it out. It's not hard to do. It's the easiest thing I ever did in my life. You just stop eating foods that aren't human food. And, and the only side effect is good health. So I don't think, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I know some people are gradualists and they say, well, I'll cut down a little at a time. And I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that because I think once you let yourself have meat on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, pretty soon you'll be having it on Monday again. Um, I really think, People need to see the light and just, if they have meat and, and animal products in their house, get it out of the house. I won't even say give it to a, a food bank because really, why do you want to hurt right. poor people? Um, and uh, just throw it out and never eat it again and stop supporting animal agriculture. Right. So we do have a little challenge though, because we have people who live in, food deserts where they can't get food like that. What do you say yeah. to that question? That, that's the hardest question of the evening because the food deserts are deplorable. And, and you know, I one thing that I'm angry about is that in the presidential campaigns, they'll, they'll talk on and on and on about health insurance. So they don't, don't talk about food deserts. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders will talk on and on and on about Medicare for all. Here's an idea for a socialist program that Bernie Sanders should support. Let's put in socialist um, uh, food markets. If Whole Foods won't go into the inner city, then let's have government food markets that, get, that, that sell uh, low cost uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. Because yes, it's, you're absolutely right, Meryl, it's hard for some people to get these healthy foods, but everyone in America should have access to fruits and vegetables. And that's more important than Medicare for all. I agree. Okay, I want you to run for at least vice president. <laughs> that's hard. To, that's hard to run for. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Let's see. Um, we have had such a great conversation. You know what? I am getting a nudge though from my people again. Um, we have been able to give away all of the gifts, I believe thus far. I think we have one of Glenn's books left, which is a gift for a $40 donation. So please, someone take advantage of that. And if you are donating anything above $5, we're also giving gifts of masks, which say, um, eat plants, save the world on them. So please um, donate. We are certainly enjoying this conversation. If you're enjoying this conversation, please let us know with a little donation. It would be great. That's how we keep our programming alive. That's how we do what we do. And um, we're grateful for anything that you can offer. <clears throat> okay. We have about 15 minutes left. So I want to hear from each one of you. What do you see as some positives that are occurring right now around planetary health, around maybe education of people who might not otherwise be aware that there's a problem or might, be, you know, prefer to keep the blinders on that there's a problem. What kind of positives are you seeing? Well, I see positives every time I go in the supermarket. Uh, as a fellow who entered the natural health food movement back in the 1970s, uh, going to health food store was pretty bleak. Uh, and uh, uh, the, you got soy milk and it has a, a box of powder that you added into cold water there and made your own. 
Uh, and now you look and there's vegan everything, vegan cheeses and meats and ice creams and yogurts. And, uh, no one's saying that they are the epitome of healthy food. They, yes, they are processed, etc. But they, no animals were killed. The, they're so much easier on the earth. They don't have cholesterol. They don't have pesticides. Uh, on every level, they are they're a great, at least transition foods. I'm not saying to be eating them every day. They're treat foods for, for vegans, have it once a month if that. But, but for Joe, meat eating six pack guy, uh, if, if he could bite into one of these juicy burgers and say, oh, I could eat that, vegan food, I could eat that. Yay, you've changed his life. And and so it's becoming so much more acceptable. There's now, I just see an Israeli company came out with a plant-based salmon that looks like a salmon cutlet. It's really remarkable. It's eerie. Um, and with all, this, all the same amount of protein and omega-3s and all of that, um, leave it to the Israelis to engineer something like that. Uh, but it's great. So the fact these products are are available not only is that helping individuals but it's a statement of how much more open society is to making this plant-based transition it's like turning an ocean liner but this is one sign that it is starting to turn uh, the media is a lot more open and friendly uh, to the idea of plant-based etc there's still a lot of antagonism a lot of craziness in podcast land yeah, but by and large, the references to plant-based everything you know, is viewed more favorably on TV. They don't make fun of it so much anymore. And um, and the uh, there's now organizations like the AFA, the Agricultural Fairness Alliance, that you should look up. Um, they are helping farmers and ranchers transition to do something else with their land besides run cattle on it. You can grow fruit trees, grow broccoli, grow hemp, uh, do, do something else and, and help these people make this transition, uh, support them, pay their mortgage, send their kids to college, help them while they make this transition. And so the, the wheels are starting to happen. And, and they're always what gives me hope are young people in the internet. You know, now uh, you, can, you can change people's concepts uh, very, very quickly and their understandings. And, and the images are getting so frightening and tragic as the ice caps are melting and the fires are burning. Uh, and the kids, uh, they know, and there's nothing, you know, there's no hiding from them. Uh, you know, they know something bad is happening. And, uh, and the, the vegan message is reaching them. So I've got a little flicker of hope here. We are in desperate straits and uh, pessimistic about a man's uh, uh, general ability to change but um, but it's the door's not closed and uh the the, the technology's there uh, the the willingness uh, among the younger generation is there and so i'm, I'm going to keep working until my last day on this planet to to help those wheels turn and and get this plant-based transition going so uh, I, there yes there's reason for hope and so do what you can in your neighborhood so uh, give do a potluck and hand out leaflets do something to make plant-based nutrition more acceptable uh, on, on every level in your world. Yeah, beautiful. Just before we go on to the next person, tell us what's going on with your moving medicine forward. What well, is that positive there? Thank you. Um, as a longtime practicing physician, I realized that it's my colleagues are the major bottleneck about why this transition is happening. We you go through four years of med school, pack uh, your head full of uh, basic sciences and surgery, and nobody's saying it's the food your patients are eating. That's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed from what they're running through their system every four hours. But, ooh, it's cultural. We can't talk about that. Yes, doctor, talk about it. And our uh, goal is to create a generation of nutritionally aware young physicians who, who are open to the plant-based uh, uh, concept uh, and, and participate in this powerful process of seeing diseases go away, so that the disease reversal through plant-based nutrition, high blood pressure comes down, diabetes gets better, can stop their medication. What an exciting way to practice medicine. So I want to put that in the young doc's heads. We're giving lectures at medical schools across the continent, uh, and we're, we're hiring someone to work full-time 
to try to start getting plant-based nutrition into the national board exams and into the medical school curricula. So five years from now, 10 years from now, it'll be, of course, we teach nutrition to our students about plant-based uh, advantages. So we're trying to make that transition happen. If people are interested, uh, go to my website, drclapper.com and click on moving medicine forward. And we'll see what we're doing and how you can help us in our work here. But uh, um, it's embarrassing for my profession to be so uh, so uh, out of, uh, for scientists who are supposed to be seekers of truth, um, there, there's almost a willful blindness not to, not to pursue this powerful tool. And that just can't be allowed to stand. So we're uh, trying to pull the scales off their eyes and awaken uh, my, my noble profession to a powerful truth. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Beautiful. All right, AJ, what do you say? Give us some positives. Yeah, no, I, I and that's hard for me sometimes when I have two. But before I do that, can I please say hello to somebody in the chat that is very influential to me sure. because I would not be here without him. His name is Ryan Flegel, and he's in Costa Rica now. You know, remember Ryan? And uh, tw over 20 years ago, while he was a college student at, in Santa Monica, he was doing activism, and he founded, to my knowledge, the first vegan culinary school, and he gave me my chance even three years before I went to culinary school. And so thank you, Ryan, because I don't think I'd be Chef AJ without Ryan. So, oh, and he was great a long time ago. I saw his name in the chat. So, so there's two things that give me hope. One, believe it or not, is the movie Game Changers. And the reason is, you know, veganism, vegetarianism, it's okay for, you know, women that can eat twigs and berries, but it wasn't really very manly, was it? But to show that, you know, NFL players can do it and win Super Bowls eating vegan, I mean, come on. So that's really going to change a lot of hearts and minds. So that's one thing that gave me a lot of hope. But what gives me the most hope that New York City has a vegan mayor, so can a vegan president be very far behind? <laughs> well said. Excellent, right? Yes, yes. One of the most wonderful things I heard about Eric Adams, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, okay, was when he was able to remove all of the processed meat from the schools in Brooklyn, was it? So. That is big stuff. That is amazing stuff. Powerful. Powerful. More power to him. I hope he can do the whole thing for New York City. That would be excellent. Amen. All right. Okay, Glenn, what do you got? Well, Give I want to start by um, also saying hi to the great Ryan Flegel. I'm glad he's out there listening. And I also want to second what AJ said about Mayor Adams. I'm I'm rooting for him and I'm hoping he does a great job in New York and that it might cause him to pivot, pivot towards the White House. So we're all rooting for him. And, and also, let me add, and Mayor, if you're listening, I hope that you're going to do everything you can to get the hospitals in New York to provide ve low-fat vegan food and the schools and make it public policy. You know, he's a great role model himself. Now he needs to go the next step and make it public policy. And I know at Bellevue Hospital, uh, there's a doctor there who's already um, uh, moving in that direction and has a plant-based program there. But we need all the hospitals in New York to do that. Uh, the other thing that gives me hope is how we're getting the message out. And let's start with Chef AJ getting the message out as she does Every on her day. wonderful YouTube show day after day after day, sometimes more than one video a day. Um, and, uh, you know, AJ is a great success story. I knew AJ when she was overweight and she wanted to do her first book unprocessed and she was asking for my help with it. And I thought, how many copies is she going to sell? <laughs> and, you know, about a year later, she lost about 50 pounds and she became the chef AJ we know today, who is a great weight loss and health expert. Um, and, uh, and went on to write uh, Secrets of Ultimate Weight Loss. So there's AJ on YouTube, there's Nutmeg Notebook, Tammy Kramer, there's Dylan Holmes, uh, Well Your World, there's the Giroudi family, Brittany Giroudi, there's Crocs in the Kitchen. There are all these great YouTube shows. They, some of them emphasize cooking more than, most of them emphasize cooking. AJ has more interviews. Um, but uh, uh, there's Mike the Vegan, who's got these great analyses 
uh, penetrating the myths out there uh, on nutrition. So there are these great vegan YouTube stars and we're getting the message out. I remember being in Warsaw in the late 90s and trying to find a place to eat. And now I'm told that Warsaw, every other restaurant is vegan. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, the, the message is spreading, but it's like three dimensional chess. So we're, we're getting the message out, but at the same time, there's a carnivore born every day. And, um, and there's a climate crisis that, that has a ticking clock. And so it's a, it's a real struggle to get the message out fast enough and to convert people to health fast enough that we can save the planet and, and save our health and not have any more pandemics. I mean, that's something, you know, there's never been a zucchini pandemic in the world history. It doesn't happen. It's all, almost always zoonotic. It comes from an animal. Yeah. If, if we left the animals alone, we didn't have 30,000 chickens in a, in a warehouse. They call that farming. I don't understand why that's farming. They stuff 30,000 chickens in a warehouse. And then the next thing we're going to have will be the bird flu, you know, and it could be more deadly than COVID. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop it and, and think of COVID as a warning to stop animal agriculture before the next worst pandemic. Yeah, excellent. Really well said, you guys. I applaud you all. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay, we have just about five minutes left. One last question. Now, we looked at like the positives just now. I want to hear one, maybe two, if you have them up your sleeve. What can our audience do right now, today, or maybe tomorrow after they wake up, <laughs> that could make a difference? in their health, in the climate. Let's do it that way. One for health and one for climate. Oh, what it's the same. <laughs> okay. Well, give it's me like a, a step that somebody can take. You yeah. know, what? what's interesting is the best diet for heart disease is the best diet for type 2 diabetes, is the best diet for inflammatory conditions. It's the best diet for the planet. It's one diet. Yeah. So well, you would say stop eating meat. That would be the Stop answer. eating all animal foods <laughs> and eat a low-fat, whole foods, okay. plant-based diet. If you don't know how to do it, watch AJ's show. All right. All right. That leaves AJ and Dr. Clapper. You have to break it down because he already took whole food, plant-based diet. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to even get more specific. Just stop eating dairy. Okay. Just, just do that. Everybody, everybody, because even if you think meat is healthy and you need it, there is no human that needs milk from anyone but their own mother. I mean, to me, that is the most ridiculous, absurd concept in the whole world. It's addictive. It's not healthy and it's cruel. And just please people like stop, just stop it. There's no excuse to, to drink milk of another species ever. I mean, you know, unless you're, I don't know, shipwrecked at a goat farm at the end of the world or something. I don't know. But it is the most absurd practice, I think, in human history. And just that's got, I mean, I would be happy if that stopped in my lifetime, to be honest. You know, if you want to go hunt some gazelle on the African savanna because you're starving one day, okay, maybe. But there's no reason to drink milk. True. Especially when we figure something, what is it, 80 to 90% of a lot of people? Most cultures cannot I'm even it. We're, yeah, we're 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 allergic to it. I'd be one of them. I'm allergic to. I'm Jewish. I'm allergic to it. Yeah. yeah. All oh, right. Geez. Knock out the animal products. AJ says, knock out the milk. All right, mm -hmm. Dr. Clapper, what do you say? Oh my! Um, open your heart to the reality that that everything makes a difference. People say, well, does what I do doesn't make any difference? Yes, it does. People look at you. They look at what you eat. They listen to your words. They look at the example you set. And it, that's start with yourself. And uh, as Glenn and AJ are saying, do do it. As they say in New Zealand, boots in, man. Uh, make uh, make the move. Make the commitment. Um, what is it to order the bean chili instead of the beef chili? You know, that's the huge sacrifice you're being asked to make, but it literally makes all the difference in the world. And 
I go to sleep with a clear conscience at night, knowing I've not paid to keep another animal in those dreadful sheds, that I've not paid for another calf to be taken away from a mother uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be exploited in the ways that our dollars create. So realize your purchases are just so important. And uh, so take responsibility. Uh, so at least do your part every day uh, to keep this precious body that you have as healthy as possible for as long as possible. And again, the, the, the plan is our larger body. It's running a fever. It's, it's, it's uh, arteries are clogged up and inflamed. You know, there are, uh, the planet belongs in the intensive care unit, in the ICU, you know, it's, and uh, it's in respiratory failure, the CO2 levels rising. It's, it's, it's a classic, you know, sick patient. Well, it needs our care. And the care is to realize what we've done. Oh, my heavens, we've cut down all the forests and killed all the animals. Time for healing uh, with a capital H. So change your diet. The forest will come back. The planet will heal. And we'll create a better uh, future for our children because we've stolen their future. What right have we had to do that? We plundered their future. And we, we need to give it back to them. I feel like apologizing to every two-year-old that I see. Uh, for what we've done to their future and uh, there's still time to repair it so um, make, make your move there's nothing if it, let them laugh at you. you you know the bigger truth and it's not funny any longer you'll be a hero uh, for uh, for the animals for the planet and children unborn yet beautiful thank you all so much I'm going to add what I would ask of our audience if you want to do something plant some trees grow a garden revitalize the soil. Those most of us can do. Even if you have to grow it in a five gallon bucket, plant some tomato seeds, plant some peppers, do that. Eat those things. Learn to nurture the soil, add water, add sun. It's an amazing um, revelation you can have just growing things in five gallon buckets. The other thing I would say is teach the children. I'm going to piggyback on what you're saying, Dr. Clapper. You know, there's that song that came out with um, the movie that was about Muhammad Ali, the greatest, I think it was, right? And the song was, um, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. No, our children are our present. It's right now. It's right now. We need to teach the kids. And while we're teaching them, we're learning, we're modeling, we're doing what we need to do, right? planting seeds, growing trees, eating well, saving the planet. That's what we got to do. That's, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> All right, you three, we are done. It's already eight o'clock. I can't believe it. This has been a rollicking, rocking conversation. Thank you so much for your authenticity and your, you know, just straight talk. I so appreciate it. I know our viewers have had a great time. We've been getting all kinds of amazing comments in the chat. All of the gifts went um, beautiful. Thank you so much, all of you. You're Thank you, Meryl. Thank you. Big piece of my honor. heart. Big piece of my heart. Been right. Honor. Beautiful. We'll talk to you again soon. Yes, next time. Good night, everybody. This has been a wonderful event for me and for everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye.